And hi, everyone. This is Michael Tino in Spring Lake, Peekskill, New York. Um, I'm not looking forward to being in Kansas City, but I'm going to be there anyway because it's General Assembly, and that's what we do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And Jessica Star Rockers, you're here uh, also on the West Coast. How are things out there? It is so cool here weather-wise that I'm frightened of going to Kansas City and shocking my system. <laughs> not sure. True. It feels um, like walking into an oven. Yes. But yeah, I'm on the West Coast. I'm also doing tech. I am um, on the Facebook live chat. So send me any questions. I'm on Twitter, hashtag The View. And um, yeah, I'm excited that Leslie's here, who was one of my professors at Meadville and was amazing. So I'm, I'm happy you're here, Leslie. Thank you, hey. Jessica. Yeah, today we have the chair of the Commission on Institutional Change, the Reverend Leslie Takahashi. Welcome, Leslie. Uh, before we jump in on discussing this, really, I, I find it a groundbreaking um, report. I want to just name that next week we are going to have our annual live General Assembly view show, but at a different time, 8 a.m. Central. So if you are in Kansas City, uh, we, we're not sure exactly where we'll be at, but uh, hopefully we will uh, know that and be able to at least put it on the CLF uh, Facebook page. Come by and say hello, and then you can be on The View. So we're looking forward to that. So Leslie, do you want to introduce yourself and let us know where you are right now as a um, senior minister? Absolutely. I'm Leslie Takahashi. I am privileged to serve as the lead minister at the Mount Diablo Unitarian Universalist Church in Walnut Creek, California. I am not there at the moment. I am on the streets of Oakland today for um, good pastoral reasons. So I'm coming to you from uh, improvised settings, but, but uh, definitely from the Bay Area of California where it is cool and cloudy today. So not preparing me well for Kansas City. Thank you. And I understand, Jessica, you have the picture of the rest of the commission and it would be great to start with naming everyone who's been on the uh, commission. So um, we're gonna be sharing the screen and Leslie, you can name everyone. And in the meantime, so what I was curious about is, uh, were you part of choosing any of the commission? Did you, was the commission completely chosen and you got the call? Can you tell us about that process and how the commission came to be? Absolutely. Um, I was not actually. The commission was the brainchild of a couple people and, um, but mostly the, of um, the Reverend Sophia Bentancourt who was serving at that time as part of the tri um, moderators, um, I'm sorry, the tri presidency. And she had the idea of naming the commission and took a lot of time to do so in a way that would um, really bring uh, some, some new voices and some new perspectives to looking at where we are as an association and where we need to be. And so it was actually through Sophia's um, pretty, pretty amazing and extended um, work that we ended up with this particular commission um, of folks. And I'll just go ahead if that's all right and uh, just say who's on there. We have, um, if you look at the picture, um, we have uh, on there on the, the upper left, and then we have Mary Byron, um, who has been active in her congregation in, um, in congregations in several states and who comes, um, has also worked um, as part of the audit team for the association and is a member of the President's Council and we have uh, Jero Farrar, who is the director of music at our uh, first ch church in Portland, and who has been very active in our Unitarian Universalist Musicians Network um, as a leader and as a change agent, particularly around issues of um, our musical inclusion and how we do um, music and um, how we do it in a way that is um, not appropriative. And then we have Elias Aponte Ortega, who is uh, works for as a professor at Drew University, also has a capacity working as a um, religious educator uh, at, with children and youth as well, and who has served as a member of um, the regional, one of the regional subcommittees on uh, candidacy and also in various other parts of the credentialing process. Um, the Reverend uh, Doctor now, Natalie Fenimore, just, just um, finished that credential, um, is also, um, at our congregation at uh, Shelter Rock in New York um, and has been a long time involved in as a religious educator and as a ministerial leader. And then uh, Caitlin Breedlove, who is uh, currently 
um, working for Auburn Seminary, but who also worked with our association in the what was then known as uh, Standing on the Side of Love um, and has been an advocate for the voice of activists and young adults. So that is the commission. Um, and I, it would be, I, I hope that we will be able to come back in some future time on The View with more of us in tow, but the week before General Assembly just didn't turn out to be, we had illness and a few other things get in our way. So, uh, so it's just me, I'm the last, last one standing today, so. Thank you so much. And I just, do you wanna, uh, uh, I'm just gonna read the, oh no, I'm not gonna read the charge, it's all good. Um, when, when, so you all were chosen, Sophia, uh, so, so is the charge, I guess this is something, uh, it, so it came from when the, there were tri-presidents for a few weeks. Did the board take the uh, initiative in terms of how, who, who are you ultimately accountable to? Because Sophia, you know, the tri-presidents are no longer um, there. So who was the ultimate accountability of the commission? So the commission was set up to be accountable to the board it was named ultimately named by the board and the board as we know functions on behalf of the association when we're not in general assembly which is the vast majority of the time so um, we are basically accountable to uh, the association through the board but but through the appointment by the board of trustees and um, and so my first conversation about um, about this uh, about being um, involved in the commission was um, a conversation with Jim Key as moderator about talking about whether we could, I could take on this, this role. Um, so that was how it, it would, the board was very involved in working um, with the idea and Sophia was very involved in actually implementing it under the policy governance. So. How did you all start once you got into a room that had, I believe you did meet before what was your first, well, when was your first meeting? How did you all start? What was your first conversation like? I'm curious, and then we can get into the details of the report. I'm really relational, so it's curious to me how folks, yeah. um, you know, within the midst of all that was going on. How, how, they, how they did that, yes. So as we know, we came out of General Assembly last year with some, um, you know, some, some pretty, I think some in, very inspiring moments. And we also had um, some moments of pretty deep, soul searching and um, difficulty looking at ourselves and saying, you know, we um, may, we've got a lot of change that we have to do to get out of um, where we are and sort of be where, not where we need to be in the future, honestly, where we need to be today. So that was a really important part of our charge. And I think one of the things that's really important about the commission is that we gathered for the first time in August at um, Meadville Lombard in, in Chicago. And we basically locked ourselves in the library, which, um, I think sort of beautifully and poetically is also the place where the Sankofa archive is housed, which is an archive about the history of people of color. And it has the papers. It's a, it's a newish archive, but it's an archive that's building the history of the voices that we often don't hear in our movement. And so that was the meeting place that we, that we gathered. And so that was an important, for me, an important symbolic place that we were there. Um, and so we, we met and what was really clear from the beginning was we did not have the energy or the inclination to spend a lot of time doing research to document that there was a problem around um, around race and power and inclusion in our association. We all came into the room with that as a conclusion, and we decided we weren't going to spend any of our time trying to prove that that was true, that the, the events of the spring, the events of the year, the events of all of our lives and our careers and our professions for those of us that are religious professionals within Unitarian Universalism had already given us that information and we were not in the least bit interested in spending time trying to document that. But what we were interested in doing was beginning to try to look at what are the structural um, elements that need to be changed to make that different. Um, and so, you know, that is um, really what we set about doing. And the other piece that I think is really important is uh, I wanna talk for a moment about the idea of erasure, right? That we, we have narratives in our faith tradition as we do in every aspect of our social and you know you you mentioned Asia being relational right so in any aspect of our life where we are relational we have narratives about um, what is good what is bad what has happened even what is history and all of those are based on the voices that we hear and all of those leave out the voices of of people that aren't um, privileged to be in those those circles where we where we remember. So a big principle of our work is around um, ending that kind of erasure and really finding ways 
that we can tell a fuller story of who we are. You know, often, and then, I, and I know I'm, I'm very passionate about this, so I, you can interrupt me at any time and I will not be offended, but I will just say that, that um, at any time in our history, you know, people will say, well, you, I, I think maybe many of us have heard people say, or maybe some of us have, who are watching have said this, but, you know, we're not just not sure that, that Unitarian Universalism will appeal to people outside of our, our white middle to upper class norm. Um, it's just, it's a religion of, of that kind of social economic construct. But what we know is that Unitarian Universalism brings people in our doors um, all the time and has been doing that for centuries. What we also know is that those voices have not been heard and have often been discounted so that those people end up going away having to have a form of Unitarian Universalism sort of on their own often. And now, of course, we're, we're, we've got other structures that allow us for people to come together, but, but that's been sort of our history. So we're trying to uh, counter that form of erasure and say, what would it be like if we could actually allow everybody to come into the room with the gifts that they have to offer and, and actually experience that kind of Unitarian Universalism, which is what I, we believe um, we need to experience for these times. So yes, to everything you're saying, one of the things I was um, reflecting on after reading this is for a long time, a lot of what's in this report, when we would have convers we uh, religious professionals of color especially, um, would have conversations about things that had been going on, instances, but it always felt like there was kind of gaslighting that's not really happening no really it was you know we're really merit-based and oh this is the reason why this person who maybe really isn't that qualified or whatever um and so right. it feels like kind of the end of gaslighting no more gaslighting it's now the commission has found in writing informal systems perpetuated right white centered hiring yep so now <laughs> that you all you know um so for me it was like there was such a oh you're naming what has been denied by people in, with immense power within our association. Even power itself is denied. I've, just in the last few days, with this conversation about religious educators getting uh, the vote, I've heard, oh, well, we don't have, ordained ministers, we don't have power, we don't have power, but really we, we are special, so we need the vote, not you, but I digress. So even the denying of power has been a form of gaslighting. So I appreciate that you've named in, the, the, the commission has named in the report what folks, especially on the margins, folks who've been uh, um, kept out for, because they've pissed off the wrong person, uh, have known. So uh, and Michael and Christina and Jessica, please feel free to jump in. But uh, Leslie, you could you know, respond to that. I'll respond to that and that would, and that would be great. I'd love to, love to engage more folks in this conversation. Um, but let me just, I have like a couple really quick things I wanna say in response to that, Aisha. So sometimes I talk about what people will say, oh, you know, there was such a mess in our association last year and all these things blew up and it was so difficult. And it was, and it was very hard for all of us. It was frightening and scary. But I also think another way we can think about that is that there has been a long time ongoing private conversation among those that have been marginalized in our association, different private conversations, actually all along the edges, right? There've been all these conversations. And what happened last year was that the private conversations became public at some level. They, they entered into the mainstream. And you know, you can look at that as a negative thing, or you could say it's actually a sign of where we are in our transformation that we're now not willing to tolerate these conversations just as private conversations, that they're actually part of our actual mainstream conversation. And that is not a bad thing. And similarly around qualifications, I, I wanna mention that the report itself is on our website, which is easily found by just Googling Commission on Institutional Change. You'll see a lot of our communications through the years there and a couple, couple things that we've put together over time. But, but one thing that I will, we highlight in that report is that the idea of qualification really depends on where you think you're going. If you think that in order to fulfill our faith, in order to really live into the promise of Unitarian Universalism, you actually have to have a racially, culturally diverse Unitarian Universalism. Then in fact, the skills that people who understand what it's like to live in these bodies and do this and have these lives are actually among the most important skills that we could offer and might be more important, for example, than uh, knowing how to use Excel well or doing a great 
PowerPoint or speaking extemporaneously. You know, there's lots of things that we have to do as religious professionals, but these are actually essential essential skills. So I want to I want to I want to mention that even what we see as as important skills is at some point culturally determined. Yeah, I think that's that's really one of the the points and you know I'll just name the elephant in the room the report that we're talking about is um, regarding the what went on around the hiring for the southern regional lead position right. last year um, right. that both Asia and I spoke out about um, pretty pretty vocally um, and that was one of the the um, issues that that I I was floored and, and struggled to articulate to folks that who gets to decide what qualifications are and what that proximity to power is in terms of how that is then translated, not just in this position, but, you know, any position within our association and any position that we're going, you know, as we say, you know, we, we can't just do this work on Sunday, we have to do it every day of the week in our regular lives, um, that is the question. Like, who gets to say what the qualifications are? And how do those qualifications position us to lead into a different kind of, of world in which everyone is free? That is the crux of, of you know, that whole conversation around qualification. Absolutely. And I think that we're in such a time of, um, of, of Bardo, you know, we're sort of in between things. We're in this very strange space, I think, where we're not what we used to be and we're not, and, and we're not what we're going to be. And yet, so what that leaves us is actually a need to be incredibly, um, uh, multilingual. And by that, I don't necessarily mean language, though that's really hopeful. Um, I mean, the ability to talk across generations of membership, the ability to talk across people's life experience. And, you know, I think one of the challenges is that we don't have the vocabulary. Um, one of the, the great, really painful teachings for me this year in doing the work of the commission is that we don't have a common language across a lot of the, of the different um, life experiences that we have in our midst. And that if we don't find that, um, we, will, we can very easily end up becoming irrelevant. If we continue to, cho to choose to speak only in the language of a very um, narrow slice of our population in our nation, um, but which is a huge slice of who is represented in our congregations, especially, we know that there are many forms of Unitarian Universalism. You're, the CLF is one of them. They're not all congregational in the, in the traditional sense, but in, in our dominant forms, the forms that people think of the most, we really have to figure out how to, to talk across new languages. When, when we first uh, planned this show and I read the report and read the, the charge for the commission, I was very curious um, to hear how the commission uh, decided where to start. <laughs> um, you know, I read this this charge that, and and you know, we can say it out loud. Uh, the, the Commission on Institutional Change is charged with long-term cultural and institutional change that redeems the essential promise and ideals of Unitarian Universalism. And I'm like, wow, that's gigantic. <laughs> I mean, that is like, is. Um, you know, you, you've got two years to solve racism. You know, we do that a lot, right? We, <laughs> uh, it, that, that's a very, that's a very Unitarian Universalist way of doing it. It's a very white supremacy culture way of doing things, right? Okay, here, you've got two years, solve racism. Um, and, and so I'm really struck. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, Leslie and I have known each other for 25 years. Yeah. Um, Leslie was the president of the congregation when I became a Unitarian Universalist. So uh, <laughs> it's not a. You were so cute. You were I, so cute. <laughs> <laughs> I, appre I appreciate that. Yes. Uh, I, was, I, was, yeah, I was. I was pretty cute. I was yes. you know, 21 and really yeah. idealistic. And um, now I'm 46 and jaded. And it's great. 
Um, but I'm, you know, it's not a shock to me that you started with um, that these stories, right? So, so unveiling the erasure, um, and I guess, and this is not necessarily a question for you, Leslie, but a question for our our whole movement. Um, are we finally going to hear? those stories because in my experience over the years many you know you said the the conversations have been have been happening right people have been um people i care about yourself included have been uh basically saying you know you need to stop erasing me now uh, as long as i've been a unitarian universalist um and I guess that there's hope that this is now an official commission report that we'll talk about at General Assembly. Um, but I wonder what the step is to actually get people to hear this or hear, hear is ableist to, 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 to actually <laughs> perceive it and take it in and, um, and, and have it transform us. Right. That's the ultimate goal. Right. Yeah. So two couple things I would say about that. And one of them is, it is a shockingly large charge. And it, you will notice in my face, because you've known me a long time, how tired I look. It's been a long year. Um, and um, we've worked really, really hard to try to take this charge very seriously. And we hold it with the deepest you know, respect and reverence. Uh, and that said, I always put it in perspective. And I think about the small group of, group of African Americans who were charged in the 80s, the Black Concerns Working Group, they were given $5,000 to solve the problem of racism. Um, we were given more resources um, in, and we are actually allowed to, to do this over a period of years. And so I think we'll do what they did, which is that we will, we will push the ball down you know, a little bit further. We will we will take, we will put the next um, layer on the sculpture. We will not solve the whole problem. This will always be our ongoing spiritual work, which is to continue to grow into, um, you know, to grow into our living tradition. That's what we're going to do. Um, that is our work forever. And we're not going to solve that. But um, structurally, what we know is that we've sort of outgrown our old clothes and we don't really have new clothes. That's kind of a, a graphic metaphor, but I feel like that's a little bit about what happened last spring was that we found ourselves sort of um, out there um, a little bit, a little bit exposed because we really didn't have um, good trust in the systems that we have. And so we're really looking at how to do that. And we started, we started with stories because there are, um, those of us that have been hearing these stories, you know, since we came into this faith. And I want to say when I was president of that congregation, when you came into that congregation, I was 29 years old. I was very idealistic and, and very um, deeply believing in this faith. And I have, I have managed to stay in, but in the process, um, you know, my heart has been broken so many times by the people that we've lost. And this is the thing that I think marginalized populations in our movement live with that people in the mainstream don't understand is how rich and vibrant, how wonderful and diverse and exuberant we could be if we weren't turning away, driving away so many people who have so much to give from their life experience. And so we start with stories because it is really critical that we learn how to embrace that there is more than one way to um, to be devoted to the tenets of our faith. And that is really what, what it is about. Um, and going back to you know, our, our history of universal love, um, it is really hard for me to imagine how we could possibly even begin to honor that legacy and live it faithfully if we don't um, do this embracing. And that means hearing people's stories. Now, I do wanna say that one of the tragedies of this year, um, and some of you know that I actually have had experience with this before because I, I came out of a very deeply wounding experience with my own journey to ministry. Um, and part of the way I did that was to um, work on a book about that and about the history of a period of time in our movement. And in that, in that time, I asked for stories too. And what people told me was, it's too dangerous to tell our stories. We can't tell our stories. 
And for three years, four years, I went and begged people to tell, tell me at least enough of their story that we could begin to, to document what was happening. And eventually people did begin to tell stories and we put some stuff together, which was part of what, you know, moving the ball a tiny millimeter. Um, and so what has really been heartbreaking to me is how many people, most of them, the majority, still feel that it's too dangerous to tell our stories and they don't feel safe telling their story. Um, and for me, that that is still so true um, is two is one is two things. One is it's it's um, it breaks my heart open um, with sorrow, and two, um, it really speaks to me about how much we have to dismantle those um, those attributes of 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 a white culture that teaches us that we can't be ourselves, we can't be vulnerable, we can't, you know, we can't be imperfect. Um, I think that, uh, and that also that denies that there are imbalances of power. So for me, we started with stories because we have to, they're out there and we need to know them. But um, we also started with structure. And, and this was an important discussion we had uh, with the commission was that we have to change some basic structures as well. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I was I, the page that I have open in the report, and I wanted to read this line, and you, you spoke to it as I have it open, is truth must come before reconciliation and transformation, and truth telling is still dangerous for religious professionals of color. Yeah. Um, and that is, it's heartbreaking, and there's something, um, it, it's hard, it's, it's beyond disappointing because we can't get to where we want to go until people feel. So for me, part of that is, People tell the truth and they're still depending. Okay, I'm going to name it. I had, I, the part that's difficult for me to um, uh, work through as a UU is how much I still think, feel, experience white men, ordained white men being protected. So if, if several people of color, rich professionals of color, had a really problematic experience you know, as a result of the behavior of someone who is a white, heterosexual, cisgender man. And yet that, you know, I've, I've seen colleagues be just thrown by the wayside for not much, just, you know, wow, what, what you know, they, they, whatever, like not much to, to get that person fired or they get that person out of even a congregation, even with ministers. But yet there's this, I don't know what that is and why that is. So, so if, so that's also a piece of, that religious professionals of color, it's not only just not safety, it's not safe. You've now been targeted as the troublemaker and there is no accountability to the person causing harm. So, I mean, I think naming that is part of kind of the system that feels stuck. Like maybe this isn't gonna change because there's still so much investment in protecting certain groups of people, certain demographics. And I was hoping that when this report came out, at the very least, there's a recognition that this is a broad, issue. This isn't about me just wanting to post on Facebook or Christina or Kenny. This is about, this is, these are the reason why two thirds of our congregations engaged in this conversation is because it was so real. So for me, the accountability piece is still huge. And it's why I still think there are folks that are like, it's not worth it for me to say anything because I'm the one who's going to get targeted. Right. I think that's right. And I want to, I want to mention two things about that. Um, one of them is that you know, when we were given our charge by the board, it had a couple specifics in it. One of the specifics was we were charged with looking at the events around the Southern Regional Lead hiring decision. That was a specific charge. We did not choose that. That was assigned to us. We talked a long time about uh, whether or not to do that and decided it was important because it is really just a microcosm of the larger problem we have with religious professionals of color in our movement. So, so we chose to accept that part of our charge. Um, but another part of our charge says specifically to examine um, the use of truth and reconciliation processes um, as a way of advancing, you know, our, our health in the association. And so here's, so we spent a lot of time, I, and, and last summer, um, I spent a lot of time um, looking at truth and reconciliation processes around the world. And they have been used in places like South Africa, Canada, you know, um, cities uh, such as Greensboro, North Carolina. But the interesting thing about them 
about the truth and reconciliation processes is that they allow, they were able to do things that we don't have the power to do in our movement. And one of those things is to offer um, amnesty to every person who, for example, in South Africa, that's how that worked. You, in order to tell, you would tell your story, but you would also be granted amnesty. We don't grant amnesty in our, um, you know, our very, um, you know, decentralized, a system of congregational polity in which, you know, truly often people are serving at the at the mercy of, um, you know, in theory, we're serving at the, the mercy of the membership, which is a wonderful idea. But often it comes down to, you know, being um, at the mercy of a couple strong and powerful individuals in a congregation who may not like the direction of change. And I think that's something we really have to look at. You know, there are different models of, of democracy. There's not just one model of democracy. And, and we've always been uh, an association that has looked at how do we practice democracy? And I think that there are people looking at how do you practice democracy as a way of, um, you know, protecting um, those, those groups that have been marginalized. And, you know, there's some of that experimentation we may really need to look at. Because right now we can't actually um, we can't actually do a true truth and reconciliation process. What we know, and we've already called for it in um, in this report, is we know that we need systems of accountability. We know that we need systems of um, we actually need we need at least reliable systems of support for religious professionals when they get into trouble. Because if you are a religious professional and you start encountering hostility that may have actually very little to do with you and very much to do with the context in which you are um, uh, working. And then you turn to the systems that are supposed to assist you. And those systems are not trained to understand the dynamics around race and culture or difference. Um, then, you know, you're really in trouble because the people that are, um, that are trying are supposed to be helping you don't have the capacity to do that because they're not sure that it's not just about you. Um, and so that's really problematic. Yeah, I'm actually looking at, um, so the final, you know, pages of the report are actually recommendations. And um, in there, I, I was so glad to hear the commission um, really address that head on, head on that you know until the time that the staff have the competency the anti-oppression competency we do need special trauma centered trauma-informed teams to be able to to respond uh, when religious professionals of color are in conflict um, because you know if you don't know the skills if you don't know what you don't know um, you know the the likelihood that you can go in and, and make things worse is real um, and and that's not any um, any knock on the skills and the heart and the the desire of those folks to do good work and to to do you know quote unquote the right thing it's it's just you know you don't know it um, and you don't even know the things that you don't know so getting folks in there who do know and who have been trained and do have the resources to support is so critical. And, and I was so glad to see that named in, in this. And, um, you know, there's a lot in the report about the hiring and, and the process. And, and I love that you called it a microcosm because that was, you know, the board talked a lot about um, tasking the commission with looking at this specific hire and whether or not that was a good idea. And, and we kind of came to it in, in the same way that you all did is that it, 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 while it was one individual incident, it had so many of the elements, right? Of everything that, that religious professionals of color have known in, in our lives of serving. Um, so while I'm, I'm thrilled that, that all of that was there, the, the recommendations that you all gave um, were just so, so specific, right? Like here are things that need to be done, <laughs> um, which a lot of times we don't get, you know, and we get the kind of glowing, you know, oh, we need to be more like this. And we need to, you were like, no, we need like this specific thing. Um, and, and so I wonder, how the commission like came to that, like how you all 
thought that 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 was what was needed because because it's just such a gift. Yes, I mean, I think again, this is where I think we're in this period of in betweenness where we really aren't. You know, I I honestly, um, you know, I really do believe that um, if push came to shove, many Unitarian Universalists, maybe even a majority at this point, which is different from when I first got into this conversation, would want us to be doing the things that we can do to allow not just religious professionals of color to thrive, but this is the ultimate. I, I see religious professionals of color as like the advanced team for allowing there to be more uh, healthy environments in which, you know, people of color who come into our congregations all the time, but they go out quietly too. You know, if we were actually able to track how many, and we're actually trying to start doing that, but if we're actually able to track how many people come in and how many stay, um, then that's, you know, a really important thing to know. Um, but, but, so I, there's one piece I want to try to remember to say at the end about that, but I want to answer your specific question about this. So what we know, at, we've because we have over time, like I said, we came into the room with our lived experience, and um, you know, and and that includes you know the lived experience of young activists who come into our congregations with with deep needs for spiritual sustenance and restoration and and. Um, you know, and care, and then they are often met with indifference or questioning or questioning their validity of their stories or whatever it is that is not um, nurturing and restorative. So what we know is that, you know, um, the, the, the reason that oppression is so pernicious and soul numbing is that it creates patterns within our lives, right? It's not just about um, one hiring decision or one thing that goes wrong in our life. It's the fact that it happens in the context of a life that has already been compromised by the overall dynamics of oppression. Um, and that that's part of the lived experience of people of color. So many um, of these, these experiences for people of color, and I will count myself, I'm, I'm absolutely um, fine to say that, that I've had enough traumatic events in my life that if something happens to me, I've now learned um, that that actually is, you know, a traumatic event for me that is, that ties back to other traumatic events. And it's really important. If someone's going to try to be my advocate, uh, my advisor, uh, my companion, my, my um, co-journeyer in a, in a conversation during this, that people have the capacity to understand what it is like to live a life where people question your reality day to day, where people deny what has happened to you, where people are not able to hear your story because it interferes with their knowledge about, you know, what's good or who's good. And so with that, if we don't have trauma informed, um, you know, um, ministry, trauma informed staffing, trauma informed um, intervention teams, uh, we will, what actually happens, and I've watched this time and time again, is we perpetuate a cycle of harm in which we actually put people who have been deeply injured back into situations um, that they're not ready to be back in. And that creates, you know, a continued narrative that is not helpful about religious professionals. So similarly, you know, the field of trauma has advanced unbelievably. It's had a quantum leap in the last 10 years. And that we're not incorporating these uh, technologies into our ministries is really, you know, it's really crazy because when people of color walk into our doors or when transgender people walk into our doors, um, you know, they've already, ex this is their lived experience. And we're saying to them, oh no, there's a level playing field. Everything's fine. Everything's good. And we're not doing ministry that's going to touch them and help them and restore their souls. So I think that's a really important part of, um, of this is to, to be able to really understand that. And, you know, critical to that, um, and this is my little add a addendum to your question, um, is that when our congregations have had a separation from a religious professional of color, to have interim ministry come in that's not informed in these dynamics can actually continue to perpetuate, um, you know, illusions about why that happened, about, you know, it's very easy, especially when someone has exited a system to make it all about them and have it be scapegoating. 
and have it be, well, that person was always a little off or that person was always a little, you know, strange or it just never quite up to our standard or a little different from us. And it, it means that we never examine in those congregations the systemic issues. And so that harm can keep being repeated. Uh, yes. Um, and to me, that's where the, that's one place in, in all this complexity that I feel strongly that the, I've worked for the UUA and Christina is currently on the board, um, where I genuinely feel where the ball can move maybe three centimeters is being intentional about training congregational life staff. Because one of the things I've seen, yeah. we have this interesting um, narrative that, well, congregations don't listen to the UUA. Yes, and when it's time for transition, when it's time to call Keith Cron at the transitions office, when it's time to work with congregational life staff, absolutely the boards listen and the congregations listen to congregational life staff. So that is not a small thing. And you named it, it's number five here. You've actually named it in a couple of places in the recommendations. Um, the absolute necessity of not, to me, there's more than than training congregational life staff, but if you don't know what you don't know, if, if there, it has been right. demonstrated that said staff isn't competent, then we need the trauma response team. And I don't know that that has happened or is happening. Can you speak to that? You know, I, um, you mean, whether it's actually happening in our preparation process or. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is all happening in real time. Yeah. I mean, the congregation I'm at is in has been in a lot of transition and right. I would love to be able to call up a, tr a response team that I that I think ha have the analysis that is crucial for this congregation. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually. Um, believe that this is an area that we really have to push in our association if we're going to, um, you know, um, be able to um, address this uh, for our association. And, you know, we, um, I think I, I came into Unitarian Universalism as a 24 year old and um, about two or three years later became involved in anti-racism work. And, and so I've been doing this for a while and I, um, one of the things we know is that there's the there when we get committed to trying to do anti-oppression work or to create an environment in which all people can can thrive and there can be inclusion and diversity and, and equality, um, there are kind of hard and soft skills. And you know it's funny because I think that the um, the ability to recognize and um, respond appropriately to the traumatic experiences that people of color have generationally in their families. Um, and to acknowledge that and to understand that, not as a way of saying, um, you know, because tokenism and um, paternalism are a form of modern racism, right? Saying that someone can't compete is a form of modern racism, but that's not what we want to do. What we want to do is to um, be able to have practices that don't, um, you know, make it worse for people that have experienced uh, trauma. It's it's really unnecessary to do that, and 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 it's actually um, unconscionable to do that. Is what I want to say. Uh, so it's important to really be able to um, have practices that actually help people heal and um, reclaim their agency. Because you know, one of the things about being um, silenced, about being erased, about being um, having your voice not heard or counted in the same way that maybe some other voices are always protected and or heard um, is that um, you can end up really um, unsure of your own leadership and agency. And so we have to have practices that restore them. And I think this, uh, tr these traumatic practices are critical. That said, um, you know, I hope by the time the commission is done, um, because our next, some of our next work is really in the area of credentialing and looking at that process as well and how we're bringing people in, um, but also how we're informing people about the people that walk into their doors as it, um, what is the, um, what is the way that ministers who are already serving learn about these things? Because that's a critical part as well. Um, and so there isn't a lot of that practice going on right now. Um, but we're going to be talking about it a little bit in one of them. Um, the commission has uh, two, two, we're participating in a number of things. We have two things that are, are sort of ours. And one of them is a theological conversation. The other is a, is a conversation about, about stories and erasure in which we are going to talk about 
the importance of recognizing trauma and and doing trauma informed ministry. And when I say ministry, I don't mean just by ministers. Every, you know, all we know that all it's a given that all religious professionals do ministry, but but all lay leaders do ministry as well. And if they're not informed, then we continue to to you know reject people in ways that are deeply deeply harmful for them. Um, well, and I want to say that that you answered you just answered a question I had about the difference between trauma informed ministry and trauma informed ministry that focuses on oppression. And I think the what you said about paternalism is really that's the piece to me that that I feel like why um, the trauma informed ministry that edu- educating yourself um, that focuses on oppression is imp- so critical. Otherwise, you I feel like particularly white you know, religious professionals would come in and, and be just paternalistic and, and, um, do more harm. So thank you. It's really a way of, um, you know, we, we've had, um, I was thinking about like, you know, how, um, we, we get interested in how to be better listeners and companions for each other. So we learn about emotional intelligence or we learn about how to do reflective listening. It's, it's a, it's a, a critical skill in the toolbox. If we're going to actually be Uh, communities that invite in people who have lived on the margins and not just ask them to be, you know, round pegs in our square holes, but really like come in with us and, and with us unpack what is and create something new, because that's actually what, you know, true multiculturalism is. It's not just changing the faces or the, the, the players. It's, it's actually allowing different people's lived experience to shape the way that we express our deepest truths. And that is not something um, that, that's something we still struggle with. Um, and, and I think, you know, the Me Too movement, for example, this year in our, in our has sort of shown how we do that even just with women in our movement still, which is a little shocking in this era. So I wanna give a shout out to the Commission on Institutional Change support staff because they are in the chat box um, supporting you and saying uh, to make sure that we mention that the commission has a workshop, um, uh, Why Choice Comes First in Truth and Reconciliation at GA on Saturday, and that also um, Julica Germán de la Fuente is available to talk to folks about those stories and get them on record. And she said she's um, also available to drop by the drum booth to get more information and set that up. So definitely wanted to give a shout out for what's going on at GA for you all. Thank you. And I'm going to actually ask, I want, I do, I do want to say that, um, that we have um, amazing staff and I want to, um, I want to thank Julica. I also want to thank um, Marcus uh, Fogliano, who is our, um, our, project manager and who just does an amazing job. I'm going to ask Marcus to type into the chat box the information about our, um, our, our theological conversation, because this is so important for us to recognize this is our core faith work. And so our largest um, offering at this General Assembly is about the theological support for the work that we're doing, because it's so important to do that. So I'll ask Marcus to do that, because um, I'm not in a position to do it at the moment. And I'm if you could read that out, I'd really appreciate that. Um, but I want to yeah, I want to make a point about that. Um, when we talked, when Michael asked the question about having such a big charge, it's really significant that we're supporting this work with resources. That that was something that Sophia was adamant about, and she really fought for, which was for us to have resources. And the board responded, and the board members also were. Some of the board members were also really deeply committed to that. And I want to note that because one of the um, long-term systemic realities about being a, a, somebody who's marginalized is that we often don't have as many just financial resources as other other people maybe in our congregations. And that one of the things about our culture, you know, we've been charged with looking at culture um, really in a broad sense. And one of the things about our culture that we need to, to really notice and change is that uh, many of our positional leadership require people to have resources to serve because they don't provide people with the ability to, um, you know, like get release time from work or whatever they need to do. And so I want to note that we do have resources and that that in and of itself is something that the um, tri presidents and the board left us as a model for how we need to do things in the future. Absolutely. Um, Marcus just posted, so Centering Theology Conversations on Faith, Race, and Liberation is at GA Thursday afternoon in the afternoon time slot. 
3 to 5.30. So we'd love to see folks there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Marcus. I, um, one of the things I've seen Mark Hicks or talked to Mark Hicks about, and I think he wrote a paper about it, is spiritual malpractice is how uh, the harm, you know, what he calls the harm done to people of color. Um, so there's harm in, you know, what happens in our spaces and our culture, UU culture. And then there's the lack of um, even the desire, although I would say it's changed in the last year that at least there's a desire to try to decenter whiteness in our worship. But when there's worship that is kind of erase, you know, you talked about the erasure, um, it, it's, so, so what's really heartening, and I think Christina, you posted, GA 2017 had two mentions of the words white supremacy, and this year it's 26. So, the, and that, there's value in that because, um, you know, the 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 opening up, the popping of the blister, so to speak. But one of the things I wanted to also um, thank you for, Leslie, is the and the commission is the centering theology because when you I was interviewed by the commission, as many many people were. But, and Leslie, you had happened to be the one that, and you said, you know, who do you see yourself accountable to? And I said, Unitarian Universalism. I'm, this isn't about any one person. It's, you know, no matter how much I love Christina, you know, or Kenny, or it's, it's about Unitarian Universalism. Who do we want to be in the world and how many people will really want to be um, affirmed in their humanity and part of what we can be. So uh, I really appreciate that that's going to be, um, a whole conversation uh, about that, about centering theology. I love that. So thank you for that. Yeah. And I want to mention two things about that. One is that um, what was really interesting in, in doing the interviews um, that we did for the um, Southern Regional Lead, and we did many, many, many hours of interviews for that in the fall and the winter, um, is that we found that people of color, when asked, who do, to whom do you feel accountable, were felt accountable to the faith in the largest sense or the theology that the faith now inherits. And we, whereas um, um, many of the white participants that we interviewed were felt that they were accountable to their colleagues or their peers or um, some set of people in, within the faith. And, and why I think that's significant is not to, to point blame or make anything a, a big disparagement, but why I think it's important is that the reason that people of color come into this faith or the reason that um, you know, just the same thing as was true for BGLTQ folks, um, and it still is true um, for many of them in parts of our, our nation, is that it's the theology that draws them in. It's because there is a lived theology that they really want to see real in the world. And they're willing often to, to be very uncomfortable, to have cultural expressions around them that are really not hospitable in order to be able to see that theology affirmed. And so that's a really important piece of why we really need to be drilling down in these times when we know th that there's going to be need to be a lot of change just generationally. If you even take the question of race out of it, um, you know, the younger generations are not seeing institutional religion as the thing that they're going to for comfort or solace. And we've got to wrestle with a lot of this. You know, um, it's very important. And Caitlin Breedlove um, has been really important. And, uh, you know, also Jero Farrar and just being really clear with us that um, neither of them um, uh, identify as Unitarian Universalists because for them, we don't live enough of the theology that we um, profess. And I'm, I'm not trying to um, put words in their mouth, but that's been an important part of the conversation for me, which is to, to recognize that we're not getting easy um, acquiescence from folks that they really want us to live our values. Um, and that's a really important piece for us to struggle with uh, today. I just wanted to lift up something that will be in the show notes. I posted the link um, that Carrie McDonald had released a statement, um, I think it was either the beginning of last this week or late last week, um, about the current, uh, there was the question about whether or not we're currently trying to do the trauma-informed ministry and all of those things about really where the UA is at in trying to provide these services that so he did. Um, post an update um, just right in, within the past week as to as to how uh, the EUA is trying to support religious professionals of color. So I think it uh, got a little bit lost in, in all of the GA shuffles. So <laughs> yeah, no, I, that's true. And there's going to be, a, I think, a, co a brief conversation about that in one of the plenaries as well on Saturday morning, I believe. So that will be something that will also be happening at General Assembly. Um, 
Thank you. We have two minutes left. Does anyone else have final thoughts before we close this? We absolutely will do another show on this in the fall because such a rich conversation. Be yeah, I really, really um, just honor you, Leslie. And, and thank you. So, so much more rich if you get the incredibly brilliant people that are the rest of the commission. <laughs> you know, they're they're actually the brains behind this, and so I appreciate that. I would really hope that we could make that space. Oh, that'll happen. Yeah, you're you're talking to everybody who can make it happen, so it'll happen. Um, okay. Anyone else, Jessica, Michael, Christina, any uh, final thoughts before we uh, close? As always, um, you know, with and without my board hat on, just thank you all so much for saying yes, um, because we this could not have happened without um, all of those folks taking uh, significant amounts of not just their time, but their spirit to do this work. And I know um, that part of it, it goes unsaid a lot, but it's hard to hear those stories when you know what that feels like. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. Um, this was really one of the best conversations. Uh, thank you. So next week, we will have our last show before our summer hiatus. We'll be in Kansas City at the uh, UUA's uh, General Assembly. And we will be uh, broadcasting live on Facebook at 8 a.m. Central. So we'll be a different, an hour earlier. I can't keep track of time. Is it on an hour Friday. earlier? Yeah. On Friday. It's a different day and different time. So Friday. Friday. And it's Central time in Kansas City. So. Central time. Yes. Uh, 8 a.m. Friday, Central time. And we will be live on Facebook. And thank you all. Yay. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you, you Leslie. Leslie. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.